Good morning. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, indeed. I never know who's going to say what when to start with. <laughs> We're glad you've joined us. This is lesson seven. We are in the dead center. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that for this lesson, but we're in the, right in the middle of this quarter at lesson seven, Christ's victory over death. And as we like to do at the beginning and the end of each Sabbath school lesson, pray. let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this Sabbath morning with grateful hearts, grateful hearts for the beautiful weather we've had. Despite the inclement of the rain, it was indeed beautiful, for we desperately need the water. We thank you. And now, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will rain down upon us just as the raindrops did this week, and truly now fill us. May we grasp something deeper and more substantial in, in studying Christ's victory over death from this week and in this summary lesson now. Open our minds that we may truly gain the blessing you wish to give us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This week, I was looking at the lessons and I thought, um, somebody asked me what they're about and I said, well, the state of the dead. I don't well, this know. This isn't actually the state of the dead. This is Christ's victory over death I know, and conquering Satan and being victorious. They were like, state of the dead. And I said, no, it's just about death. And I said, our hope in death, our Christ's victory in death, everything, but it's death. The, the court is out. And they're like, okay. Well, but it is that death, especially Christ's and his resurrection, that makes the whole point of this. Yes, exactly. And so, as we look at the memory text... And I, finally, not an NKG, JV. Okay. Yay! New yeah. century version. Which I very much like. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death. And to the place of the dead. And that's Revelation 117. Um, that's the Alpha and Omega verse. For those of you who um, might be looking at that thinking. Sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> um, when we look at this. The, um, the, the idea that Christ's victory came with his death. But it's his resurrection that sealed the deal. Well, that gives us purpose beyond death. Well, had he not risen, had he not... Uh, how do I try this? I'm very careful which verb I use because I tried to make it always that Christ brought himself back to life. Well, and that's one of the Bible verses this week. So, Yes, but I can't say he was risen because, because Christ rose from the grave. There we go. That's the central point. Satan totally lost. He knew he was ultimately, ultimately defeated and he would die because Christ rose. If he hadn't, Satan would have claimed victory because that would have been the second death of the man, Jesus yeah. of Nazareth. But that didn't yeah. happen. And, you know, I love the fact, and I've shared this with my students. Yes, they're only nine and ten, but they need to get, they can grasp these things, of course, that the point of Jesus's death and resurrection is what makes it all sensible. And the fact that if he didn't r raise from the dead... Raise from the dead. Yes, yes, that's true. There'd be no point. And then if people, when they died, if they were good, went to heaven and bad to that hot place, as I refer to it, because I don't want to say the H-E double toothpicks word in school, though we've talked about the fact that it doesn't exist biblically. But in any case, there'd be no point of his second coming to raise the righteous because yeah. they're already in heaven. Why would he come back? So, and you can see them, the little wheels in their head turning. It's like, yeah, why would he come back again if all the good people already were in heaven? Mm -hmm. And that's so logical. And I never thought of it before until this week's lesson. Yeah. The last... Next to the last paragraph, almost the entire 
sentence, it's hard, a uh, paragraph rather, it's hard to understand why the resurrection of Christ and with it our resurrection are so important if, as many believe, the dead in Christ already enjoy the bliss of heaven as they have gone home to be with the Lord. Yes, if they're already there, what's the point of the resurrection of the righteous at the second coming? So, looking at Sunday's lesson then, the sealed tomb. I often think that as we look at, at the end of Christ's life, I was reading um, from Desire of Ages, and if you go through the crucifixion and then each chapter after that that goes through um, where he rested in the tomb and then um, as the heavenly messenger comes on Sunday morning um, and then of course the response of the soldiers the response of the the um, Pharise or the the priests in general specifically Caiaphas and then um, as as you look at the uh, rest of the story. To me, this is such a, a great way to understand um, the progression of this. It's such a great way to understand um, what was at the end. What, what were we looking at? And what was significant about the people and the fulfillment and how it all came together. That's, that's important to look at. So his mission is ended. He's successful. The it is finished. It's done. We talked about that last week. But then, what happens after that? And we can look at Matthew 27, which is um, the end of this. And we look at a verse... 62. Don't go too far because Matthew 28 finishes the, the book. So Matthew yes. 27, 27 is part of Well, it's the end of 27. That's what go. I was trying to get to. So, um, the tomb is sealed and guarded. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how imp um, that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, order the sepulcher to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and then tell the people he's risen from the dead and that, at la that last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you want. And they went and made the sepulcher secure by sealing stone and setting guard. Read that very first part again. Then the next day... Um, that mean. is after the day of preparation. So does that mean they went to Pilate on Sabbath? If no, that's I think it was on Friday night. If that's the case, oh my goodness. After it was broke Friday Sabbath. night. Yeah, it was on Friday night. They were very worried. And so they took that, rolled that stone right there. And of course, Jesus and the disciples, it was, it was nearing sundown. When Nicodemus and... and um, so they did go to Pilate on Sabbath. Well, yes, Friday night, but Sabbath, yes, indeed. But they had to make sure, you know, because that was important. Um, it's interesting. Um, the priests, uh, the... How shall I say? The hosts of Satan, um, the Romans, were all trying to hold him into the grave. Lock him in. Don't let him out. Let's see if we can keep him here. That's Mondays. That's Sundays right here. And so when you um, look at it... That's Mondays, the leaders, the Roman guard. Yeah. But as... It also is right here. But the point of it I'm going to is that the, the tomb was to be sealed for three days, which would be... Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. No. Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night was their intention. So that on no part of that third day, oh, even like this much of the third day, could be. And when I read that, I, I hadn't realized 
that they wanted that tomb sealed, well, permanently if they could, but for sure they wanted to make sure that it passed that, that the end of and into that next day. And of course, remember, the sealing of the tomb is not like the way we see seal crypts today that we can get them airtight, of course, but... But then this was just rolling, it was a, with rolling, a, Roman rolling a stone across the way and Pilate's power signet and some sort of mark to yeah. say, you break this, you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, because it's been, it's been se sealed by Roman law. And the lesson points out that because of the way that they thought of time, and perhaps still do today in what they call the Eastern inclusive language, according to our lesson, any fraction of the day is the day. Mm -hmm. So if you're into the first hour of the day, that's the day. So you could say, yes, I, it took me three days to get there, when it actually may have taken two days, two, 20, well, 49 hours. Yeah. You know, or 48 hours and one minute or whatever. I doubt that a little bit. But in any case, you get the point that it wasn't three 24-hour periods, but the leaders wanted to be sure it was a 72 hour period or hour or longer so that the three days i'm going to take my life up again wouldn't be possible yeah well i find it interesting <laughs> the priest knew all his miracles the priest knew all kinds of things and maybe the, the soldiers might have too because of his fame notoriety yes indeed but when we look at that I think, how could they have been so foolish? And they knew the scripture. <laughs> as to think, well, and that's the part that's amazing to me. Knowing the scripture, but refusing to look at how it's interpreted. And even, even Satan. Satan knew, you know, and yet he has his, his hosts around, just like rejoicing. I guess we're going to keep him in. Really, he had beheld the magnificence of God, and he lived in the magnificence of God. Yes, and I just well, yeah. you know, perhaps, perhaps angels' ability to believe is similar to ours. You know, they say twenty-one days, and you believe it, and you're what you believe is your reality. And maybe Satan convinced himself that. If he could keep him there, that would do it. Well, Ellen White, I was reading in the um, Desire of Ages, and I'm going to say it's in the chapter um, that has to do with um, when he was in Joseph's... In um, Joseph's Tomb is the title. Yeah. <coughs> Pages 769 to 778, if you're yeah. interested. Um, that Satan's... How shall I say? Minions. A, well, yes. Had been only partially aware. And actually, the other worlds and other beings, um, the heavenly beings as well as whatever their other beings there are, um, had um, not realized the fullest extent of Satan's deception until it came... Um, right up next to the perfection and the love and the, uh, I don't know, purity of Christ's sacrifice and Satan's deception was revealed not just to those beings, but also to his own. And that they were like, wow, that's, that's bigger than we thought. And it's, to me, that's very interesting that it would be at that point that Christ would, or God, would open the eyes of even his own followers um, to realize how far the deception had gone. And of course, then they're all in. You know, they're going to double down, um, as we say. So, um, the guards that they had, a hundred of them, the Romans, when they trained as guards, hardcore. Um, my students and I are, you know, looking at the difference between Roman and and Greek guard, um, Greek military, and in the military, they.
They were given minimum diet, minimum, um, you know, everything was at the minimum, but the extreme for exercise and extreme for training. And if you could steal food without getting caught, <laughs> you were rewarded. And if you got caught, you were punished, um, beat up, whatever. And they were hardcore. These are, these are tough guys. And even they had to admit that eventually it's deep down. They well, were worried. They were worried. They, they witnessed the most spectacular event since the creation of Earth. Yeah. Which no human has witnessed. But uh, the Creator coming forth victorious. Yeah. But the earthquake they'd gone through, the darkness... You know, that had well, to shake them a little bit. Well, two earthquakes. One yeah. at Christ's death and one at his resurrection. Yeah. I wonder if the resurrection earthquake was just the angel coming down and touching the earth. Who knows? Anyway. The tomb rolling away. And shook the shook the earth. No, I think I don't know. never mind. Yeah, never mind. Well, that brings us to he is risen. Mm -hmm. Too bad that wasn't Sunday's lesson. They put it on Monday. But in any case... Satan truly hoped that that uh, Jesus would not be able to take up his life again. When he was in the tomb, it's like, whew, I got him there, all right. And uh, he truly thought that just as Moses, he claimed Moses was a prisoner to him, to Satan, in, while he was buried, Christ being buried, he now is a prisoner also of yeah. Satan. And when the heavenly messenger comes, the... Satan's angels, his followers, disappear. They're terrified. And that angers him. What do you mean you're not standing up to him? What do you mean you're not going to? Um, you know, but when he saw Christ come forth, Satan was a witness to that. And I think God had that specifically planned as part of Satan's punishment to help him realize that um, it's done. I said it was done, and it's really, truly done. So, Matthew 28. Ready? Turn the page. Nope, it's right here. Ah, huh, right there. Okay, so we're going to do 1-6. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, I love that, Mary and Mary, um, went to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back that stone and sat upon it. I love that. It's like, I'm opening the tomb and I'm just going to sit right here. Well, you know, he opened it by flicking his finger. Yeah. Anyway, his appearance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They just fainted. But the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come to see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Lo, I have told you. That's one through six. You know, I find it interesting that throughout Christ's life here on earth, the people to whom he chooses to tell of the amazing things, his birth, who knew first? A woman. After his death and resurrection, who knew first? Women. They didn't see him first, but they knew first, for certain, for the angel told them. The soldiers may have awakened from their um, unconsciousness by that time. Who knows? They may have heard it. They may not have. But the very fact that God chose to tell women first. <laughs> You've got to admit that God's sense of humor is, <laughs> is truly remarkable. Because he's kind of like, you guys got it all wrong. Let me help you understand. In fact, do so. I'm going to tell women that. I am risen. I rose from the dead. I'm not here because I'm gone to my Father in heaven. But I'll come a little bit later. Uh, 
a couple days from now in the lesson say it talks about his, Jesus's appearances after his resurrection and it's interesting if you look at the historical facts but we'll get there and Ellen White does a beautiful job I went back through and read it again um, you know as he's coming what do, does he look like um, I would encourage you to read it doesn't take a long time I'd forgotten those chapters go very quickly um, they, they read very quickly, um, at least for me. Um, yeah, I do like to read, you're right. So I want to look at John 10, 17, and 18. For this reason the Father loves, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. Uh, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. When we look at the the birth of Christ, we we struggle with the concept of how could this being be fully God and fully human? But when Christ laid down his power, it wasn't that he was no longer God and only human. It was that he, that God part of him, he laid it down and said, I will depend only on my Heavenly Father. I can pick it up anytime I want, but I'm the one to lay it down and I can pick it up, whatever. And that that concept, when you look at the fact that he said, that part of me, will be just sitting here waiting till after it's finished. This human part of me is going to depend on my father. In the lesson, the authors point out that after the text that Tracy just read in John, there are several others in the New Testament, of course, Acts, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, that say God, meaning God mm -hmm. the Father, raised Jesus from the dead. And, you know, I, you, people say, well, that's contradictory. Then, then Jesus wasn't God because he, he couldn't raise himself. But, but he un, did. But until we, like Christ, fully depend upon God, we are just as dead. Yes. And really, when you look at the, um, the, the commission and the, um, in my Bible, in the Matthew verse, it says Christ's resurrection is spoken of by Peter in Acts. The fulfillment of, of you know, the utterance in Psalms from David. He himself plainly foretold that he would rise from the dead. Other witnesses um, to the, histor um, the history of this, of the resurrection, include the Apostles, Paul, um, 500 brethren who met the risen Jesus kind of at one time, Wednesday's lesson. and the hard-headed skeptical Thomas. But when we look at this, this is the part that I want to, um, to look at. For the believer to accept his atoning work and that the Father had accepted not only that atonement, but then approved um, his, his um, how shall I say, his resurrection as the, the time to move forward in time where Jesus would then become our advocate. So he can became the propitiary of our, for our sins. So, um, As you look at Matthew 28, it goes on and talks about how the, the, the guards went and told what had happened. And they were so shell-shocked that it was just like blurting out the truth. And then the, the priests were like, wait, wait, wait. This is the story you're going to tell. This is what you're going to say. And they're like, if we say we were sleeping on the job, are you kidding? We're... We could be put to death for that. 
We wouldn't do that. And so in this, this um, beginning part, we find out, and if you read, you know, the story of the resurrection that Ellen White tells, they were really scared that they would be put to death and that, that Pilate would punish them. And the priest said, don't worry, we've got, we, we'll take care of Pilate. And once again, instead of standing up, you know, you read where he washed his hands and said, I don't want any more of this. You know, I find no fault in him. But Pilate, you'd think that he had a chance to repent. And still by the time he goes to the guards, tell me what happened. Okay, don't worry about it. We've got it taken care of with the priests and with the, go and don't say anything. The priest said that, not Pilate. Pilate also, if you read Ellen White, and it's like, oh my goodness, he did not punish the men. He did not punish the soldiers. And why? Because it also would have come back to him, why couldn't a hundred soldiers, a stone that was so big that could hardly be moved, and a hundred of you couldn't keep it closed? Are you kidding me? I mean, the whole thing would have been so outrageous. And Pilate did not want that. Be sure to go back and read, because it's it's interesting. I hadn't, you know, there's just stuff that you add every time you read, um, especially in Mrs. White's work. Um, but they, the soldiers, it says that Pilate never had a, a day of peace ever again. Never had a night where he could sleep the night through without um, his conscience being hit again and again and again. And yet, he still continued on. Oh, well, not a whole lot longer. Yeah. But anyway. So, do you have something at the end you want to say? No, I'm on the Tuesdays lesson already, dear. Oh, waiting. there we go. Okay, well, we're going to move along. Tuesday. In the timeline of Jesus' crucifixion, death, resurrection, there was an earthquake at the time he said it is finished. At that time, the Bible tells us in Matthew 27 that the earthquake was great, that many tombs were open. But then it was at the earthquake at his resurrection that those tombs have opened to the people, according to NKJV, saints, fallen saints, they were resurrected. 500 brethren is what my study Bible says. Saw Jesus. They weren't resurrected with him. Oh, okay. And those people, now, they came out of the graves as, not as they went in, but fully restored. And if you, if you think about it, if they were been in their graves long enough, they, some of them might have been giants to the folk who would have seen them. But these people went, and quote, into this holy city and appeared to many. So here we have witness of people long dead, or maybe not too long dead, saying, I've just been brought back to life by the Messiah who rose also. Or I rose with the Messiah. Or who knows what their words were. But they testified. And of course then ascended to heaven with Jesus. But you know here again. More evidence of his resurrection. And I wonder if some of the soldiers didn't kind of do the. But no he really did rise from the dead. I saw it. On the QT you know. I'm sure they did. Um, it also said in Ellen White that there were. Many of the priests who worked in the temple who became believers also. So in um, if we look at the, the end of the lesson for Tuesday, um, humanly speaking, the chief priests and elders had great advantage. They held religious power over the nation and were able to convince not just the Roman authorities, but the crowds to help them with their schemes. And what's interesting is that as time went on, their lies and schemes proved they, false. They unraveled. And, yeah. And they were not able to keep that going. And that, 
you know, it's a lesson about lying. Don't lie. But it's also a, a fact that God's truth will win out over the in the end. The uh, reference to the priests believing is in Acts 6. Oh, I'm reading Acts 6 right now. Verse 7. Um, because of the people who were resurrected, Jesus' resurrection, and they, of course, were powerful witnesses to the fact. Yeah. And, and the, it says, Acts 6, verse 7. The word of God increased... And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So there you have the fact that in shortly after Jesus' resurrection, the, the priests put everything, they, some of them, put it all together and said, oh yeah, Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. Definitely consternation for the priests who wouldn't believe it, Caiaphas and his lot, because there were many who did. Yeah. All right. If we look at Wednesday's lesson, who are those witnesses? That's what we've been talking about. Mary Magdalene, right? And the other Mary. Not that Mary, the other Mary. Well, there were, there were five major instances right away where Jesus appeared to people. The Mary, the two Marys and other women at the tomb. But they, he didn't, no, he appeared to Mary later. But at the tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and women heard of Jesus' resurrection. Then Jesus did appear to the disciples and then to Peter. The two men well, actually, we don't know they're men, but the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, he met with them and walked them for a while. And then the, the disciples in the upper room, and then a week later again to the disciples where Thomas now was with them. So five times just to that smaller group. But then as Tracy read in the, in the Bible, and during the 40 days between his resurrection and ascension, over 500 people at one time as well. So many people saw him during that 40-day period that it's a historical fact. You can't refute it. It's not an opinion. It's not a fable. It's not an urban legend of the day. It's reality. Yeah, and it's also um, written about um, by Tacitus. That's what I said. Yeah. Many, it, it's a historical irrefutable point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the Romans, as they uh, describe it, they have, it's like, we don't get this, but this is what's happening. And, um, you know, you can see how, how effective he was with these people. But, you know, uh, it's, it's spreading and it's just uh, you know, unfathomable why this is happening. Um, I, was, I was thinking about the end of the lesson spends quite a little bit of time, and Ellen White does too on the idea of Thomas and the struggle that he had. He was, a, he was an Iowa, Iowan, you know, from the Show Me State. Okay. I knew there had to be a joke there somewhere. Um, and Jesus doesn't go... I can't believe you can't believe it's me. Well, it's like when Philip said, show us the Father. He was like, seriously, Philip? I've been with you three years? Hello? But yeah. no, that, that was our, that would be our response. It wasn't Jesus. He might have sighed because he was human after all, but he dealt with them graciously. Yeah. And, you know, when he was struggling and Jesus goes, here, let me, let me have you. Touch hand. me. Yeah. I am real. Come on. And, Get it right for yourself. And recognizing, you know, the, the nail scars that were still very obvious and it's will probably, be obvious. Probably quite. And here, quite, go to uh, my fresh. side. Still, it's three days, four days, even yeah. 40 days. It's still be very, those yeah. wounds were 
significant, they wouldn't heal rapidly. And here, reach into my side um, where they plunge the spear. And then Thomas is like, oh, you are, you know, my Lord and my God. And the Christ, you know, says, okay, you've had to touch to believe, but blessed are those who don't need that, who just believe. They see, they believe even when they don't see it firsthand. Oh, and that's, that's the faith. That's the faith that, that those who lived before Christ, who, some of whom were resurrected at Christ's resurrection, and those of us who have lived after Christ, who have not seen him, did yeah. not see him. I was thinking about that, because part of the question is, what, what other reasons do you have a faith for faith in Jesus? And I thought, it came to me, for each one of these disciples of Christ, for each one of the people, whether they were the ones who were raised from the grave, whether they were the Romans, whether they were the um, priests or the the pre, um, priests converted or the um, other, whatever other people. What was really significant in this is they all had a testimony. They all said, let me tell you about my experience with Jesus. And I thought, this week, that's something that we need to work on developing all the time. Do I have a testimony? What is, what is my experience with Jesus? What do I have to tell? And for us, of course, it, it isn't like seeing things necessarily, but it can be our experience and knowing that Christ was behind it or in front of it or wherever well, he is. But there also is the seeing of how Christ's life has impacted others and has created miracles within themselves yes. or perhaps others. You know, you, you hear of people who are riddled with cancer and a day or two later, they're not. No medicine was administered. No possible scientific explanation, but a miracle of God. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if other parts, other places of the world may have been some people raised from the dead. We don't know. Okay, so Thursday's lesson. The first fruits of those who have died. I like this part of this of this lesson very much because it it goes into why that term is used, what it really means. I never understood it fully until this week. That the it was, of course, that part of the world then and somewhat to somewhat still to. To this day, it was very agrarian based, and so the first fruits, which they had a Sarah, uh, festival of the first fruits in the Jewish calendar, was very significant to the uh, Jewish culture of that time, and it had great religious significance as well, because it recognized, of course, that God was the provider and gracious giver that as long as they were good stewards, that their crops grew and they were ready to be harvested in the early period of the time, uh, of, the, of the season, rather. And then they go into re to referring why they, the uh, biblical authors chose to use that, is that the Christ, Christ as the first fruits, shows what our resurrection bodies will be like. In God's final harvest, he raises us from the dead and brings us into his presence. And that the fact that Jesus came forth from the grave glorified, yet he still did have the nail piercings. And you know, I've always wondered, is that all he's going to have? The nail piercings and the scar on his side? Or will he have the little dots on his forehead? where the crown of thorns jutted in and tore his flesh there too. Maybe, maybe not. But the fact is that he didn't come forth from the grave with any human frailty, so to speak, or deformity, or whatever the case might be. 
he didn't go in there as broken and bleeding as he went in there. Though he didn't have bones broken, his flesh certainly was from the beatings and the whippings and hanging on the cross in the short time that he did. If you look at Deuteronomy 26, this is the part of the first fruits that goes back to the story of the Israelites going to the land of milk and honey. And, um, you know, it, it talks about give to the, um, you shall put your first fruits in the basket and give it to God. And then it goes on, take it to the priest and say, you know, here's my first fruits. Um, I give it to God and the priest shall take it and put it in front. Then it goes through like the Egyptians and how they'd been in bondage. And then we cried to God and God brought us out of Egypt. And I'm abbreviating quite a little bit. But when we get down to um, verse 9, it says, And he brought us, meaning God, um, brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And this, I like this. And behold, now I bring the first fruit of the ground which thou, O Lord, hast given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you re shall rejoice in all the good which the Lord your God has given you to you, to your house, you, the Levite, the sojourner who is among you. Um, when you look at that, that idea of coming before with, this is what you have given me and acknowledging God's great gift. Then when we look at Christ as that prototype or archetype that, um, it, he is he is the first fruit of man again off as an offering to God in place of us and that in the end we will be that harvest that first fruit that he brings to his father and said these are the ones these are the ones that I died for this is this is my offering. And it's, it starts and talks a little bit about, Tom and I were looking at some of the similar things, um, but it's remembering that when we look at the children of God, we don't know exactly. It says that we will be raised immortal, but we'll still have to have some you know, we'll be human. We'll still have some aspect of that. But will we, will we, once we rise again, and you know, Paul always talked about there's something that was wrong with him, some malady. A thorn in his yes. side, in his flesh. Um, we'll be raised immortal. And, um, incorruptible. And so, you know, we will probably, I hope, be cured of all of those when we go to heaven. Yes, um, dear, you will be 16 feet tall and... That'll be wonderful. And amazingly beautiful. Well, thank you, dear. Um, but every print that Christ carries... Well, the, the, the scars of crucifixion. Yes. And so I, I, I'm... I'm I'm tending to lean toward a, away from having the thrown of crown marks on his head because yes. that would disfigure him. Yeah. But the the marks of crucifixion will will remain there forever as proof of of the sin. sin being gone forever. And we will be here. I I, I paid the price. Here it is. I I have proof of it. You can see it. Uh, Thomas, come and touch it. <laughs> Yeah. Here it is. And, you know, it will remind us again of how vast and how extensive and how amazing the plan of redemption is and was. To and we us. will study it and try to understand it forever. And still will be, how, yeah. how is this possible? How, how could you love us to that extent when we treated you that way for thousands of years? Well, that's nothing. Thousands of years are, are nothing. Yeah. Thousands of years of nothing. You know, I 
was sharing with my students again this week that, you know, at the end of the millennium, Jesus wipes away our tears. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. It's not until that time that that happens. I think there's a lot of crying going on in heaven. The angels, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. I tell my students somewhat jokingly that the river of life that flows in heaven is filled with God's tears as he looks at the mess down here that we've done to ourselves because of sin. Well, it's a nice, a nice metaphor. And not anything. choosing to follow him. Yeah. But once that's all said and done, and we understand why things happened the way they did, and Jesus returns to destroy sin and Satan and the earth and make it new, there'll be no more sorrow, no more death, no more sickness, no more tears. Yeah. All For restored to the perfect unity, a harmony rather, that his original plan was for this perhaps solar system. Yeah. Friday, um, when we look at Fridays, it, you know, it pulls the lesson together and looks at um, a little review of, of the lies that we're told, the expectation that we can keep his resurrection quiet and and it won't get out, and people won't know it. And and um, they talked about things that I'd never even heard about, that some argued that Jesus had a twin brother. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can just imagine, you know, put it forward a few centuries, and you're, extra, extra, Jesus of Nazareth risen from the grave, extra, extra, you know. <laughs> and But also looking at, um, you know, well, he wasn't really dead, he just fainted, and then they were able to, you know. Wow, they stuck his a spear in his side, but he only fainted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, that you know, his disciples had stolen the body, and and he hadn't really gone back, but you know, they just stole the body so they could say he had. And, I mean, they had all kinds of ridiculous stories. And our author's pen, the historical evidence is so strong for Christ's resurrection that these are the kinds of arguments people concocted in order to try to dismiss it. Mm -hmm. With the resurrection itself so important, we should not be surprised by all the good reasons we have been given to believe it. Yeah. And then, like often, Friday's lesson is a rather lengthy quote from Desire of Ages, and it's in the portion of uh, Why Weepest Thou? The voice that cried from the cross, It is finished was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of the sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus will it be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves of the unbar and, uh, and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall rise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves were opened, but at his second coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice, and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him. Above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. You know, for a third grade education, that author penned some amazingly beautiful passages. Yeah. I should say volumes. I should say thousands of pages. And they were penned by hand in, in the day. Then set to type and then finally, and then set to the printer. But they were all handwritten. Hmm. The story of the redeemed is a story that when we look at Christ's death, you know, Ellen White says you should ponder it often. You know, if we would look at his death and, and ponder it and think about his sacrifice to us every day, our hearts would be quickened to, to realize his great love for us and to respond to what he, what he hopes for us, what he wants to give us, what power is available to us every single day. And 
when, when he said it was finished, why is it that we hold on to, I don't want to say not believing it, but not living it? To why is it that we are not, you know, fully enmeshed in the, the how shall I say, in our relationship? We, we study, we pray, we do, and then we go on with life. And then, oh yeah, that's where I was. I was focusing on that. And then we go on with life. And oh yeah, I was focusing. It's, it's a struggle so often to keep the focus on Christ is sacrifice. And yet, when we see him and when we believe as we see him in our life, that's where the connection begins. And we see him alive, risen, and alive and working in our lives. And so this week, I want to encourage you, um, if you didn't read this, go back and read it. Because it's a, a beautiful um, picture of his sacrifice, but more than that, what he wants to be in our lives. Let's pray. As we close this lesson, may we not just close it uh, for the week, for the month, and just let move on to the next thing. Lord, may we may we be aware of the great sacrifice you made for us, but that it's not just about the sacrifice, but that you want to be alive and living in our in our daily world. May we be open to your spirit may we be open to your leading so that we can show others the christ and they can see you in us for we pray this in jesus name amen, amen. have a great sabbath